بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وعلى بركة الله نبدأ محاضرتنا الثانية من محاضرات الـ Joint and we are going to start about the review about the previous lectures that we have mentioned before in the, <coughs> in the previous lecture we consider the following important information regarding what we have studied before we are studying before anatomical structures of the impromantable joint and the way that we could make an accurate diagnosis and what are the difficulty in order to make a diagnosis of the TMJ and what are the disorder which is going to be affected the temporomandible joint so we are going to start regarding review of the previous lecture before we are going to go continue the disorder of the temporomandible joint at the beginning as i say the joint is a unique but it is bilateral joint and function as one unit and we go further regarding the anatomical structures of the temporomandible joint and we have studied the capsule and the articulating disc and we have an idea about the capsule is considered to be as a dense fibrous membrane that surrounded the joint and incorporates the articulating eminus and we go further regarding the formation of the synovial fluid or the synovial joint and we have some idea about the articulating disc and we consider most about the articulating disc in the anatomical structures of the TMJ because it is considered to be as a fibrocartilaginous tissue and we have some idea about the anatomical structures of the, this articulating uh, of this articulating disc and we see that the central area of the disc is avascular and lack innervation and it is act as a cushion like between the head of the condyle of the mandible the inert and between the glenoid fossa and we have some idea about the posterior ligament the surrounding capsule which is long has a both the blood vessels and nerve this is the most important aspect that we have been concentrating regarding the anatomical structures of the temporomandible joint. And we go further regarding the ligament. Even we study the ligament also. And as I say before, there are three types of ligament which is going to be represented associated with the temporomandible joint. And this ligament, one of them is considered to be as a major. And two minor ligaments. The importance of the ligament during the movement of the temporomandible joint is usually defined the border movement. Another way, the extent of the movement of the temporomandible joint. The major ligament that we have concerning is the temporomandible ligament, which it is actually thickening the lateral portion of the capsule. And also we have more idea about the other types of ligament, which is the stylomandible and the sphenomandible. This is the most important aspect that we have been concerned in the previous lecture regarding the anatomy. And we have some idea also about the movement of the temporomandible joint, which it is the rotational types of movement and the translation type of movement. And we consider about the etiological factors. And we see that there is initiating factors and there is a predeposing factors which is going to be affected. And we have some idea about some of the initiating factors of the temporomandible joint starting from the psychological to the occlusion. And we have some idea about uh, some of the factors which is going to be influ which is going to be influence the masticatory system as a general token, like for example, the behavioral factors, the social factors, the emotional factors. In addition, we have some idea about the effect of the occlusion, open bite, overjet, 
any other informations that are related to the unilateral lingual crossbite and so on. And in order to make a diagnosis, there are many, in order to make a diagnosis, there are many signs or symptoms of the temporal mandible joint disorder. And this may include pain, limitation, deviation, itching, facial pain, looking of the joint sometimes is may occur. And we have more idea regarding the disorder of the temporal mandible joint. Also, we have some idea about the pain, the joint knows whether it is a clicking, popping, the cause of the jaw popping. And now it is not completely understand. And sometimes there are many factors which is going to be influenced. Also, we have some idea about the limitation and the hypermobility of the joint. And the diagnosis, which is considered to be very important, we have been studied the following the internal dearrangement of the temporal mandible joint. And we divided the diagnosis according to the follow. The most important things that may be a rule is the articulating disc, which is considered to be as a fibrocartilaginous tissue. And we divide it into disc displacement with reduction. Disc displacement with reduction with intermediate locking. And disc displacement without reduction with a limited opening. Disc displacement without reduction without limited opening. And during the diagnosis, we have been seeing there are different clinical symptoms that are associated with any of the previous disorder that I have mentioned before. Clinical symptoms with disc displacement without reduction, disc displacement without reduction without limited opening. It may give me hints how to make a diagnosis. And we have even other disorder which is called the posterior disc displacement, which is considered to be a specific entity. Again, another disorder we have been studied is the osteoarthritis. So from now, this is considered to be at the previous review of the lectures that I have mentioned before. And today we have this all start with the osteoarthritis, which is considered to be as degenerative changes inside the tissue. So how the osteoarthritis is going to be developed? What are the clinical symptoms? What are the other things that we could notice during the osteoarthritis? So the clinical symptoms, we could see that the pain here, the patient may representing with a pain on opening, also limited in the mouth opening. And sometimes the coarse grinding noise on function during the movement of the temporal mandible joint. If we are going to take, if you are going to take a history from the patient, we could see that the patient may have a history of a clicking. It has now stopped. The most important thing is deviation on opening to the affected site. Mostly it's going to be affected the females around 35 years old. And the patient previously may have a micro trauma. Usually from a maximum voluntary contraction force, or even sometimes if we are going to take a history from the patient, we could demonstrating that the patient may have a previous blow or trauma to the mandible. Again, Presentation of the osteoarthritis, if we are going to take an x ray, could demonstrate that there will be a flattening of the condyle. And sometimes, osteophate on the condyle could be noticed by the x ray, which is considered to be as important radiographical finding of the osteoarthritis. Here. 
pain, the clinical findings are pain. Movements of the mandible or the motion of the mandible is going to be decreased. That is to say, the range of the motion. We could demonstrating that there is a heavy occlusion. That is to say, the occlusion is going to be a clitoral and osteoarthritis. On the extra oral examination, we could see that the patient may have facial asymmetry. And if we are going to taking X-ray, sometimes we are going to see loose of the condyle bone. In of the osteoarthritis, sometimes it may occur on eating or talking, that is to say, during the functional types of movement of the temporomandible joint. In addition, sometimes the pain may refer to another area, like, for example, the ear. In advanced stage of the osteoarthritis, if there is increase in the degenerative changes, here the patient may complain from jaw locking. And pain in the front tooth of the bridge and dysfunction and disability of the temporomandible joint. This is the most important the clinical finding. That is to say, starting from the extra oral examination, we could demonstrate facial asymmetry. During intra oral examination, we could see occlusion of the patient. And sometimes during the functional examination of the patient or during taking history of the patient before examination, we could see that the patient may have previously been exposed to any source of a trauma. Or when we are taking history, we could see that the patient may have a previously clicking before. And if we are <clears throat> investigating on the pain, the pain may be representing on the palpitation of the lateral pools, they refer to the air. And the pain may occur during the functional movement of the temporomandible joint. Then an osteoarthritis, mostly affected the female, may associate it with a pain limitation, a symmetry of the face. This type of pain may associate it with the crepitus or may associate it with the clicking also. Another disorder which is going to be affected. The temporal mandible joint is rheumatoid arthritis. Here, the temporal mandible joint is very rare to be affected, and it is mostly affected the temporal mandible joints <clears throat> in the later stage of rheumatoid arthritis. That is to say, we couldn't expect to find any rheuma, any uh, temporal mandible joint sign on symptoms in the early stage. Anyhow, this is considered to be as a diagnostic challenge for the dentist. So the TMJ is going to be affected by the rheumatoid arthritis, which is considered to be as an autoimmune disease. In the later stage of rheumatoid arthritis, not going to be a care in the early stage. We want to make a diagnosis. Sometimes we could demonstrate on the radiographic. The early stage, we could not find anything. But if we are going to use a combine CBCT, we could demonstrate degenerative changes of the temporal mandible joint. A general talking, rheumatoid arthritis is considered to be as a chronic, systemic, the most important, the autoimmune inflammatory disorder, and mostly associated with inflammation of the joint, sometimes may associate it with erosive properties, and multiple joints of the body is going to be involved. In the temporal mandible joint, in the last joint, or it is going to be affected in the later stage of the rheumatoid arthritis. This is the most important clinical finding. Again the, uh, again, the patient may complain from pain, limitation, and crepitus, and so on. <clears throat> this 
sound of the noise could be demonstrating pain. This type of pain may be associated with facial pain headache. And sometimes the limitation in the mouth opening, the occlusion is going to be affected. This types of pain may be associated with the masticatory difficulty. The pain sometimes may extend it to the air, which is mostly associated with tinnitus, vertigo, and even though the pain may extend it to the neck, shoulder, and sometimes a patient may complain of form. Some patients with pathological internal derangement of the temporal mandible joint, however, are asymptomatic. And sometimes we could not demonstrate any sign or symptoms of the temporal mandible joint. Even there are many types of study regarding the involvement of the temporal mandible joints with the rheumatoid arthritis. And they have seen that only small percent of those types of patients who is complaining of rheumatoid arthritis may complaining of the temporal mandible joint disorder. As we are going, as previously we have been know the laboratory test which may associate it with the rheumatoid arthritis. We have been studied before the laboratory investigation which is which are required for patients with rheumatoid arthritis during the investigation of the laboratory. So only small percentage, as I said before, have been involved with rheumatoid arthritis, and these are the most common sign or symptoms of the temporal joint involvement with rheumatoid arthritis. Another disorder which is going to be affected is the infection arthritis. And here, there will be infection. The area, and another area. And this infection is going to be separate. The temporal mandible joint. Sometimes even by direct extension from the adjacent infection, that is to say infection, the parotid gland, for example. Or sometimes there will be hematogenesis separate of a blood-borne organism. That is to say, from the area distant to the temporal mandible joint. And here, the patient may complain from inflammation. The jaw movement is going to be affected, mostly associated with the limitation and the swelling, downfall, and redness of the area could be demonstrating. If you are going to take an x ray for this area, the mostly what we are going to be find is a negative, and to specify this is going to be a care in the early stages. And patients, what I mean, patients with infective arthritis may attend to us complaining from pain, swelling, and tenderness and redness of the temporal multiple joint. If we are going to take an x ray in order to demonstrate the changes, we could not demonstrate any x ray finding. And the most important thing is that. Is mostly occurring in the soft tissue, which is actually not going to be demonstrating by the X ray. And to specify this may occur in the early stage, we could not demonstrate any X ray finding and is considered to be as a negative. But if the infective arthritis is persisting for a long period of time inside the temporal mandible joint, it may associate it with bone distraction that could be demonstrating by the X ray. So, in order to make a diagnosis, in order to prescribe the definite types of antibiotic which is required for the infection of arthritis, here sometimes we are going to take aspiration, you know the sensitivity test which is required for the superiority of arthritis. Aspiration to confirm the exact microorganism and prescribing the correct antibiotic. However, this is this medication is used to prevent the permanent joint damage. As I say before, sometimes the infection is going to be started from distant area, from the protest area, from the submandible area, 
even infection sometimes may separate from distant area by hematogenesis. In order to make an accurate diagnosis, aspiration is going to be taken from this area, from the swelling redness area of the temporal multiple joint in order to know the exact cause of microorganisms. It's what we call the aspiration. Uh, this view is going to be represent the process of erythrocentesis that we are going to discuss later. The exact treatment for the patient with infective erythritis, you have to put the patient on proper hydration. The antibiotic is going to be scribing and to specify the penicillin G, which is considered to be as a drug of choice. And after making ultra sensitivity test, this type of test that I have been that we have been discussed before regarding knowing the exact antibiotic which is specific for these types of microorganism. And this is going to be used by antibiotic sensitivity test. I use different types of antibiotic, as I have mentioned before, this method. And we're going to be demonstrating the zone of inhibition surrounding the antibiotic disc as the media. Uh, for the methicillin resistant staphylococci, infection of the oral structure, sometimes vancomycin, which is going to be used IV, and sometimes we use incision or drainage or of the Curative infection for the pus. After we are going to prescribing specific types of antibiotic which is required for this infection, the heavy dose of antibiotic is going to be administered to this patient. We are going to prescribing patient exercise for the passive jaw opening in order to improve the limitation of the movement of the temporal multiple joint. And then the basic principles of dealing with a patient with infective arthritis is knowing the proper antibiotic which is required, knowing the source of infection which is required, and sometimes we need a drainage. Then after that, we are going to prescribing the exercise in order to improve their movement or the limitation of the movement of the temporal multiple joint. I'm going to review what I have mentioned before. We start with the rheumatoid arthritis, infective arthritis, and osteoarthritis. These, these are the most common disorder which is going to be affected temporal multiple joint and we have been discussed the clinical symptoms and the method of treatment of that other disorder which is going to be affected the temporal multiple joint which is called traumatic erythritis from its name trauma means that the patient have been previously exposed to a source of a trauma for example Dental treatment may play a role regarding that, or even, and this may occur due to the tooth extraction or opening of the mouth for a long period of time, and this is mostly akin in root canal treatment, for example. <clears throat> even though we are going to take in history, we have been seen that the patient who previously have been exposed to the general anesthesia and due to the intratracheal intubation, the temporal multiple joint is may affected. The pain and the tenderness with the limitation of the motion may occur. Here, the diagnosis is going to be taken at the beginning as the X-ray. It mostly is going to be considered as a negative except when the intra-articulating edema hemorrhage is going to be widening the joint space. <clears throat> Again, the treatment of a traumatic arthritis is going to be starting with a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. We are going to apply heat or cold 
and instructed to the patient to have a soft diet and instructing him to have restrictions of the jaw movement. Rheumatic arthritis, <clears throat> which is going to be occurred by the acute injury. We have to investigate the previous history of the patient to see if there is the patient have been exposed to any source of a trauma. The source of a trauma may be related to the mental causes or sometimes may be related to the general anesthesia or even the patient have been exposed to a blow to the temporal mandible joint. Please note that in my during the diagnosis, look what I want to say from the hair, even in the eye, in the mouth, the jaw, sometimes the extension of the pain to the neck, to the throat, the air problem. Each of this area or the temporal mandible joint going to be extended to it is going to be extend its pain to different area and what I want to say from this slide the patient may attending to you actually he is not complaining on the pain in a specific area in the pretrigus area of the temporal mandible joint but this types of pain is going to be separate into different area to the head to the eye to the mouth the jaw issue, and sometimes it may associate it with another symptoms that I have mentioned before tonight is popping and sometimes ringing. Look how much the importance of the extension of the temporal mandible joint is going to be occur. As I said at the beginning of the first lecture, of the temporal mandible joint sometimes may extend to a different area and the patient cannot represent you with a typical facial pain. Sometimes the mix in the pain of the temporal mandible joint when other types of pain like for example typical facial pain or vascular types of pain as we are going to see like for example the migraine and so on, gastro types of pain headache. These types of pain actually when attending to your dental clinic is going to be confused with each other. So please try to be attention or, or caution taking when you are going to make the diagnosis of any source of the facial pain because it's cannot represent a clinically as a separating entity. It's going to be confusing with each other. This is the most important things if we want to interrupting between the temporal mandible joint and another type of pain. Another disorder which is called the ankylosis. If we are going to investigating, we are going to see that the patient even previously have trauma or infection. Some of them congenital. Some of them may occur due to the progressive of the rheumatoid arthritis. And here, the mostly the patient may complaining from limitation in the motion, limitation in the mouth opening, or rest of the condylar growth. And here, the patient during extra oral examination, we could demonstrating that there is a facial symmetry. We could divide the ankylosis into true ankylosis and false. So what is the difference between the true ankylosis and between the false ankylosis? The intra-articulator is mostly associated with the true ankylosis. This may occur. 
and this should be this distinguished from the extra uh, extra articulating which may cause by enlargement of the coronal process fracture of the zygoma scarring may result from the surgery radiation or infection here in most cases of the true ankylosis X-ray of the joint may show, may show loose of the normal bone agriculture. So what I'm going to be focused is to try to differentiate between the true ankylosis, which is mostly associated with intra-articulator, from the false ankylosis, which is considered to be as extra-articulator. Here we could demonstrating that the X-ray be aid in a diagnosis. The CT scan which is considered to be as a very important in order to know the exact diagnosis of the ankylosis and the hair the patient may complain from the, the asymmetrical of the face during the extra oral. Look the bony enlargement. This is the coronet and this is the condyle. The condyle process, how it is going to be fixed with the clean out force and the patient are not opening and his mouth and he is complaining from asymmetrical of the face and severely limitation of the mouth opening, the bony growth of the condyle, how it is going to be representing. Again, fused of the head of the condyle within the bone. We could demonstrate in here. This is a coronal, this is a condyle, this is the fused. Look, the fused of the bone. The patient cannot be opening his mouth. There will be severely limitation of the mouth opening. And this could be demonstrated by x ray, by CT scan, by the cone being CBCT also. Actually, the ankylosis is going to be passed into different stages. And these stages could be classified according to the CT finding of the head of the condyle within the clean out fossa. Look, abnormalities of the head of the condyle is going to be representing. Almost the head of condyle is going to be fused with the clean out fossa. And the type 3 and type 4 completely fuse of the head of the condyle. And here the patient do not have the ability to open his mouth and there was a severe asymmetry as of the face, a swelling of the face and mostly is going to be treated by surgical operation. Ankylosis, this is a completely ankylosis of the bone. Almost to be uh, completely fused of the bone. It is starting abnormality or deformity of the head of the condyle. And here we could demonstrate abnormal of the growth of the head of the condyle. Late and the rare finding in some cases, it affects both sides. In severe cases, there is a loss of the mandible condyle support. And here the patient may have retrognathia. This could be demonstrating by the extra oral examination. While sometimes congenital temporomandible joint ankylosis, which is considered to be as a rare maxillofacial disorder, here there will be characterized by significant reduction in the mouth opening. That is to say, from a few millimeters to few centimeters in the absence of the acquired factors, which are considered to be as a trauma or infection. And this may contributing to the ankylosis. During the examination of the patient, we could demonstrate that there will be a lateral deviation of the mandible end. Again, lower facial asymmetry. As I before, retrognathia, the mandible, sometimes macrognathia. The dental occlusion is going to be affected, and here the patient is complaining from dental malocclusion. 
Sometimes in the advanced stage of ankylosis, the patient may have the following breathing difficulty. Hypotonia. Scissor attack may be a cure. That is to say the neuromuscular system is going to be affected. A general talking. And we could demonstrate sometimes there will be additional dysmorphic features of the temporomandible joint or the joint. A general talking. If we could summarize all of these. Extra oral examination we could demonstrating in the patient with ankylosis whether it was a true or false ankylosis the patient may complaining from retrognathia micrognathia the dental mic mal occlusion that is to say the patient cannot occlude his mouth within normal during investigation we can see that the patient may have a breathing difficulty and sometimes the patient Bones of the muscles is going to be affected, that is to say, hypotonia. And most important, in a rare condition, the neurological effect, that is to say, the patient may complain of seizures from time to time. All the dysmorphic features of the joint is going to be affected by the process. After we have been studied, the disorder, the most important disorder of the temporal multiple joint. We are going to have some idea about the way that we could make a diagnosis. As I say before, it is very difficult to make a diagnosis for the temporal multiple joint. There are different ways, whether uh, annual functional analysis, well, diagnostic criteria. But we are going to study with the imaging of the temporal multiple joint. I have an imaging to be assist in the diagnosis. But before that, the history is important in the physical examination to see if there was any clinical exam, clinical finding. Like, for example, the pain, the limitation, the deviation which is considered to be as the most important characteristic features of these types of patients. Here, multiple imaging modalities could be used in order to make a diagnosis of the temporal mandible joint. We start with the primitive way. It is a pain radiographic, whether it's transcranial or transmaxillary view, or the panoramic. These types of the radiography, we could not just demonstrating most of the cases, but the patient may complain from fracture, dislocation, or severe degeneration of the articulative. That is to say, we could not demonstrating the early degenerative changes of the impermandible joint by using a plain radiography. But we could demonstrating in the advanced stage fractures. Dislocation, severe degenerative, we could use the following review transcranial and the transmaxillary review. The computer tomography, another way of the examination, which is called the CT scan. Here we could demonstrating whether there is internal disc dearrangement, the erosive erythritis, cess er erosion with a disc displacement, sometimes idiopathic condyle resorption, or more severe form of the condyle erosion associated with high-grade internal derangement. It is can may be used for the ankylosis, whether true, false, osteoarthritis, which is considered to be as a degenerative changes. If the patient have previously been exposed to any source of a trauma to the temporal multiple, which may associate it with a condyle fracture, and osteochondroma could be detected also by the CT scan. Another way for the examination, what we call the magnetic resource imaging. 
which is considered to be as a comprehensive, comprehensive joint evaluation in a patient with a sign of symptoms. Or if we suspect that there will be internal joint arrangement, here we are going to evaluating the articulating disc in the position of the meniscus and the morphological structures of this articulating disc, which is, as I said before, act like a cushion, like in structures to prevent bone to bone erosion. Whether there is abnormal in the morphological feature, abnormal in the position of the feature, that is to say, disc displacement. Again, the MRI may use if there was any effusion in osteoarthritis. And the most important thing is if there is any rupture of the retrodiscal tissue, which is considered to be as a posterior attachment of the articulating disc. Again, the MRI may use if there is any disc injuries. Any irregular or rounded morphological features, which may indicate that the patient have diseases in the temporal mandible joint, all of these could be detected by the MRI finding. The most important things that we are going to be focused regarding the MRI is the structure, the position of the articulating disc or the meniscus. We want to demonstrate whether there is internal derangement with reduction, without reduction. This is mostly dependent on the articulating disc and its position. Here, the MRI is recommended in order to confirm our diagnosis. Then, I'm going to be say there is a CT and there is MRI, and each one have a different entity that's going to be used. CT is mostly used if there was any involvement. MRI is used to demonstrating the soft tissue and the articulating disc and the position of the articulating disc. If there was any round morphological features, rupture of the retrodiscal tissue, look at the indication of difference between using the MRI in between the using of the CT scan. Each one has a different entities, and this is mostly dependent how we could make the primitive examination. Therefore, you are going to refer the patient for the exact investigation, whether to use CT or whether to use another way, which is a simple, non-invasive type of method. Mostly low cost may give me a preliminary investigation to diagnose the internal derangement. Is the sonar or the sonography? Yes, sometimes we could demonstrate the coronal and the condyle process. The muscles is also is going to be used for the examination. This is the mystoid area. Did I say the OPG? The gross osseous abnormalities going to be used only when there is any bone involvement we do not give a useful information <clears throat> when there is no bone element is going to be affected that is to say it is not going to be demonstrating the fibrocartilaginous tissue adjacent self tissue surrounding the temporal mandible joint Also, it do not give useful information concerning effusion, which may associate it with a disc displacement. <clears throat> as I say before, if we are going to use the OPG, many different views such as submental vertex, transmaxillary, transcranial, which is used to reduce any superimposition of the bone during the investigation, so a limited use of the OPG. In OPG, you could not demonstrating the position of the disc, you could not demonstrate the adjacent soft tissue, the cartilage, and so on. And we have to know which type 
يعني ال different views which are going to be used by the OPG again what I want to be focused on the facts that you have taken into consideration there will be limited value of the diagnosis of a specific condition which may cause temporal multiple joint dysfunction because mild degenerative changes is seen equally in symptomatic and asymptomatic that is to say asymptomatic patient sometimes may have a degenerative disease but in early stage it is very difficult to be demonstrating and have here is not recommended as a routine investigation in all patients who are representing for the temporal multiple joint symptoms and it is going to be recommended only for that type of patient who have lacked response to the conservative type of a treatment therefore the early changes or the early or the mild degenerative changes could not be demonstrating by the routine x-ray or by the OPG. After we know the most common types of <coughs> investigation which is required for the diagnosis of the temporal mandible joint and we are going to jump into the treatment. Treatment is usually starting with a non-pharmacological management that is to say the curative pain education of the patient the patient at the jaw rest, soft diet, is the most common type of instruction, moist wall compress, lots of strategic exercise that we have been studied and we have been you know, during the clinical of the oral medicines, Kellena and an exercise, stretching exercise that we have to prescribe for the patient, which is considered to be as the most important things. Anyhow, we have to put in our mind that immobilization has shown no benefit and may be worse in system because it makes the muscle contractions muscle fatigue the most important things reduce the synovial fluid production which prevent the bone to the bone generative changes for the synovial fluid which is act as a lubrication prevent the head of the contour within the glenoid fossa pre <coughs> prevent the degenerative changes and then at the beginning we starting with the non-pharmacological management and this may include the education to the patient giving him some instructions wall uh, compress is going to be applied to the patient and passive strategic exercise is that is to say the physical therapy Sometimes the physical therapy does not improve the symptoms of the temporal multiple joint. Technique sometimes it could be active or passive. And during our dental clinic, we have seen the most common types of physical therapy which is going to be used for the patient with the temporal multiple joint. And the main aim is going to use is to improve the muscle strength the coordination, the relaxation, and also the range of the motion is going to be improved. Sometimes we are going to use electrosound, electrotherapy, and laser sometimes is going to be used for the temporal multiple joint. And there are different types of studies regarding using of the laser. In all departments we carrying many studies regarding the use of the laser in the treatment of the temporal multiple joint and, <clears throat> and we have some good results when we are going to use the laser with the treatment of the temporal multiple joint therapy puncture which is going to use the treatment of the myofascial pain of the temporal multiple joint but here the patient he have to consult or change your behavior decrease in the stress Action, after elimination of the parafunctional habit, which is a great role in the development of the temporal mandible joint, like for example, the tooth grinding, and here 
We are going to avoid this of extreme multiple movement, excessive opening during yawings, with air brushing and flossing. Here the area or the point when we are going to use these needles in order to relieve the temporal multiple joint pain. This is the area when we are going to use. Till now, it's not have been well investigating. And there we do not have too much information regarding this method in the treatment of the temporal multiple joints. We are not conducting practical studies regarding that. So after all the previous way that we have been used, starting from the non-pharmacology, we start with the pharmacological management. The, pharmacolo uh, the pharmacological management is going to be starting with a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. <clears throat> Sometimes we are going to use a benzodiazepine anti-epileptic. Muscle relaxant, which is considered to be like, for example, the relaxone. And sometimes bicyclic antidepressant drug is going to be used. And here, the most common type of the antidepressant which is going to be used for the implementable joint. It is all metraptine, dispramine, and oxypine. These are the most common types of medication which are going to be used as antidepressant. And these types of medication also is going to be used of a patient with a chronic implementable joint pain or the patient with a myofascial type of the pain. Regarding the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, naproxen is mostly used and may have a proven effect in the reduction of the type of the pain. medication that I have mentioned, for example, the benzodiazepine, which is considered to be as a muscle relaxant, but generally limited to two to four weeks in the initial phase of treatment, diazepine, volume, clonazepam, abantine also may provide a benefit effect, but short acting. It are not recommended if it prescribed should be used with a short period in a setting of severe pain. Actually, I do not recommended dentists to use this type of medication. Another sequence in a treatment, we are going to describe the patient, the vital plane, the basic principles of the vital plane is to have the equal distribution of the force of mastication during the paroxysms and Try as much as we could the neuromuscular harmony in the masticatory system by creating a mechanical disadvantage of the functional forces with a removable appliance. The goals of treatment are to improve the jaw muscle function. It may associate it with pain relief. And here we are going to establish stable balance occlusion. This is the main aim. That is to say, the dental split is going to be act the neuromuscular system. And here we have to establish a stable balanced occlusion. And this could be occurred by the occluding and non occluding split. Stabilization split fabricated to improve alignment of the upper and the lower teeth to prevent the force of the proxisms or the clinching on a specific area equally distributing all the force to prevent the tooth contact with each other. It's what we call the non-occluding supplement. Simple supplement primarily open the jaw. It release the muscle tension to prevent the tooth teeth clinching which is considered to be as the main etiological factors which is going to be starting the implementable joint. And the pain is going to be initiating and transmitted to, through the neuromuscular system to the temporal multiple joint. Mostly is going to be formed by salt, phenyl, and 
are easier and could be fabricated. <clears throat> After all the previous lectures, that are, uh, all the previous methods which is used for the diagnosis, the non-pharmacology, the pharmacology, and the beta plane or the supplement. Sometimes we are going to be use the surgical treatment of the temporal mandible joint. When there is a pathology, this may need to be removed by surgical. There is a resultant loss of mechanical function. That is to say, the patient with ankylosis and cannot be open and closed. And when there is a pain that is related to the joint pathology, we are going to refer the patient for the surgical treatment. Surgical procedures, sometimes condylectomy, specify and mostly detectable in the management of recurrent self-reducing disc displacement. Or sometimes the erythroplasty. Erythroplasty is an umbrella term that refers to the group of temporomandible joint surgical procedure approach with an incision directly into the joint itself and mostly used for patients with internal derangement and mostly used for patients <coughs> in which the non surgical <coughs> method cannot be made improving in the symptoms of the temporal mandible joint. So, antilectomy and erythroplasty, which is considered to be as a surgical procedures, when all the previous methods could not be gained an improvement in the temporal mandible disorder. Another way, what we call the erythrocentesis, this is considered to be as a minimal, <coughs> minimally invasive surgical technique, which is used for the management. Erythrocentesis, it is as simple as way we are going to washing the temporal mandible area. But it is need a highly specific or aseptic condition. Here we are going to use the two needles into the superior joint space for the purpose of hydraulic extension, then joint leverage. It is mostly used in a patient with a closed lock or in the peripheral self-reducing disc displacement disorder. And here, the erythrocentesis will help to mobilize interrupted disc and will be remove the nociceptive inflammatory mediators. It is going. It is considered to be as a washing of the synovial area, and it is going to be removed any nociceptive inflammatory mediators. While the arthroscopic surgery, minimum invasive diagnostic, therapeutic procedure, mostly done in the hospital, and it is method we use for the diagnosis, lysis, and adhesion, and leverage of the inflammatory mediators within the superior joint space. The erythrocentesis and the erythroscopy is used for the diagnosis. Erythrocentesis is removed, is going to be used remove the non sative inflammatory mediators from the superior from the synovial <coughs> fluid <coughs> uh, this method which is called the erythrocentesis of the temporal mandible joint actually <coughs> we could demonstrating with a procedure which is considered to be as a minimally minimum invasive surgical procedures. It is mostly used for a patient in order to relieve the joint stiffness from fluid build up. And here we are going to use a small local anesthesia before we are going to start with this procedure. Before we are going to injecting sterilized fluid to flush out the liquid into the joint. And this area in and around the jaw points, uh, which is considered to be as uncomfortable to the patient. And before, uh, after, after making this 
procedure. We are going to prescribing some painkiller to the patient. And sometimes swelling in front of the air is going to be demonstrating. And the patient may complaining from difficulty in opening the jaw for weeks. And as I said before, erythrocentesis is a procedure of aspirating synovial fluid out of the joint. Erythrocentesis is similar in technique to joint injection. In this area, that is to say, there is a line that's going to be drawn from the acanthus to the eye to the air. And after that, we are going to use a two injection. And this medical term or this erythrocentesis method is going to be applied for any procedure which is going to be used to removing the fluid from the joint. And it is need a highly qualified doctor to perform this procedure. And a highly septic condition. And the joint aspiration is used to obtain fluid from the patient joint for examination in the laboratory analysis, for example. And sometimes we are going to use, if the patient is complaining from joint diffusion, which mostly occur for arthritis, and sometimes it may use for the diagnosis or the infection. Also, is this a procedure is need a highly qualified dentist and need a highly aseptic condition. But it is considered to be as a minimally invasive surgical method. It's mostly used for a patient who is complaining from internal derangement. And the specify is going to be used for a patient who is closed look. That is to say, it is washing of the joint. And in some condition, washing of the joint with the possibility of the depositing a drugs or other therapeutic substance into the joint. Thanks a lot. After finishing this method, we are going to have some idea regarding the temporal mandible joint. The general talking, the aspect that we are concerning about is the anatomy, the diagnosis, and the treatment. What I want to say at the end of this lecture, I could not cover all the aspects of the temporal mandible joint because each aspect it is need a specific entity in order to make a diagnosis, in order to make a treatment, in order, in order to have information regarding the types of movement on the temporal mandible joint. But a general talking, knowing the anatomical structures is very important to knowing any disorder of the temporal mandible joint. Knowing the way of the diagnosis and the different modalities of a treatment is essential for the dentist in order to managing those types of patients. So, if you need any further question, if you need anything to be clarified, please do not hesitate to contact at any time. We will be ready to answer that. And I finally, there are different types of research which have been conducted in our college regarding the temporal multiple joint. And these research, including Master and PhD have been conducting many, many times by many students and they have been gained great achievement in the diagnosis and the different modalities of a treatment. If you want to have a further clarify regarding that, please do not hesitate to ask us or to contact regarding this important subject and the importance because about half of those types of patients who's attending to the 
for dental oral medicine department, they are complaining of frontal temporal multiple joint, and there is a great confusing to differentiate between, between the different way of the diagnosis and the different modalities of a treatment. Thanks a lot. Hoping that you could understand the major aspect of this important